All right, now it's recording. Um, one other, oops, go away, there it is, okay. One other housekeeping and kind of agenda slide before our presenters get started. Uh, obviously, I'm doing introductions and housekeeping right now. Uh, all of our attendees are muted on entry right now, but please feel free during the question and answer session um, built into the presentation tape, please feel free to unmute yourself and ask your questions that way. As you can see, we're going to have three speakers today, kind of a panel presentation, and I've asked each of them to present for about seven to eight minutes on their topic and then have time for questions for each of them after each of their short presentations. So feel free to uh, think about your questions. You can write questions into chat while the people are presenting if you think of them. Or again, if you want to just unmute yourself after, they, after their speaking time, then ask your questions that way. Either way works. A quick overview of our speakers. Speaker number one is Emily Calhoun with UW Credit Union. She'll speak on credit score and credit worthiness. Our speaker number two is Mark Gamak. He is a finance lecturer here on campus. Um, he's going to talk about investing and savings. And speaker number three is Paul Nylon. He is our UWW accounting professor and a lawyer to talk about wills and trusts. Uh, each of our speakers um, will address, again, will address their topic and then have time for questions and answers after each of their little segments. I will also send out a survey at the end so that if you want individual follow-up from any of our presenters, you're welcome to request that using that survey. Uh, that's where you can also request a link to the recording if you haven't already done that. So that'll be a survey on the last page. Uh, I'm going to close our poll now before our presenter starts. And just to give everybody a little idea of who's here, I'll show our aggregate responses so our presenters and everybody can see that. So it looks like we have mostly staff and most people rate themselves around average, probably pretty typical. Uh, so if that gives us any information going forward, that's very good. All right, if no, other concerns at this point, we'll go ahead and get started with our first presenter, Emily Calhoun. Thanks for having me, guys. Good afternoon. I appreciate you taking some time out of your day to hop on and be a part of this. Uh, I've been with UW Credit Union for 11 years, and I've been managing our Whitewater location for a little over three years. So I've really come to love being a part of the Whitewater community and wish uh, we could be there right now too. Uh, so I'm here to talk about credit scores and one of the great parts of my job is financial education. I get to get out and talk about all things credit and budgeting, banking, just to help educate Oops. members of the community as a part of our core values. Uh, so the credit report is just one of the most important financial documents about you out there. It sticks with you. From the moment you're 18, it's irrelevant until the very end. Uh, anytime you apply for a loan, it, since that's my realm of business, uh, somebody looks at your credit report. And we are looking at it and we see a whole bunch of different things. You can see here what's in a credit report, identifying information, some basic stuff, name, social security number, date of birth. And then creditors and payment history. So any type of loan or credit card you've had in the past, if it's been in the last seven to 10 years, we'll typically be able to see that on the credit report. Every on-time payment, every late payment, it's all in there. Other things that maybe aren't necessarily loan related that show up on the credit report and could still affect your score could be those bankruptcies, judgments, liens, um, lawsuits, even medical, past due medical bills can show up on the credit report and affect your score in a, a negative way. And anytime you initiate an inquiry, which means your credit's been pulled, if you wanted to have your credit pulled to apply for a loan to buy a car, let's say, then anytime somebody pulls that credit, you can see a list of that on the credit report as well. Anything in the last two years you've pulled it for. And on occasion, your employer will even update your employment information with the credit bureau too. So that will show up there as well. And all of this stuff on the credit report helps generate your credit score. It all goes towards a risk assessment for lenders. If you're applying for a loan, it tells the lender how risky would it be to give a loan to this person. And that's why having 
a better history on that credit report gives you a higher score, and that higher score will thus give you better interest rates and save you money in the long run by having good credit. Misconceptions about what's in a credit report but really isn't would be income. You do provide income to a lender when you're applying for a loan, but that doesn't show up on the credit report itself. Checking account activity or debit card activity will not be there. Medical history is not there. We can see those past due medical collections, but would have no idea what medical history it's related to. Any other identifying factors such as race, gender, religion, or national origin wouldn't be there, along with driving records, declined loan applications, criminal records, declined loan applications, no one sees it all. They only see the times that you had your credit retrieved that we talked about before. So these are all of the areas of your credit score that contribute, areas of your credit history that contribute to your credit score. The biggest section there is your payment history. So simply paying your bills on time has a huge impact on that. Paying your bills on time will keep your credit score looking much better than if you were late. Uh, if you are a couple days late, don't hesitate to pay that bill as fast as you can because it will only count as late on the credit report once you're more than 30 days late. So if you remember after five or six days, don't put it off until next month. Just take care of it right away. Uh, your lender may penalize you with a late fee depending on what their policy is, but at least you know it will not impact your score because you got it in before that 30-day mark. Then you've got the amounts owed out there. Amounts owed are reflecting the total amount you owe on everything, but it also is looking specifically at your utilization of credit cards. So it will look better if you have a smaller balance against your limit on that credit card. Let's say you have a, a limit of $10,000 in your credit card and you have a balance of $9,000. You're nearly at the top. You're almost maxed out on that credit card limit. That will bring your score down significantly versus let's say you typically only have a $1,000 balance on your credit card. So having less on there and more credit available than what you actually need does look good for your credit report. Length of history is another big factor, so don't close out an old card necessarily. If you're not using it anymore, you could leave it open in the meantime if it's not charging you any fees or impacting you negatively in another way. Just leave it open and let that long-term credit history build. You've also got new credit, anything you're applying for new loans and types of credit used. Just getting some credit variety it can help build that score. Just having a credit card is a great place to start, but later on you might have more than one card, uh, maybe eventually a car loan, mortgages, that depth really helps your score grow in the long run. And a lot of people ask me, do I need more than one credit card? Not necessarily. You could still have a fantastic score with just one. I personally think it can help to have more than one for building your credit, but also in the event that maybe your card isn't accepted somewhere or just a backup for emergencies. Um, you know, if you have a Discover card, maybe that's not accepted at every merchant, it might be helpful to have a Visa or a MasterCard. But I certainly don't recommend getting 10 or 20, and that's a lot to keep track of. Uh, but one is a great place to start and go from there. So who else is looking at your credit score besides financial institutions? Uh, we look at it because it helps us determine those risk factors I was talking about. See that score to determine your interest rates in terms of loans. But let's say you work in a financial field, employers in that field will typically look at a credit score to just get another look at how responsible you are. If you're paying bills on time, that might lead towards other areas of responsibility, showing up to work on time, being a hard worker. Uh, landlords will also do that as well. If you're starting a new lease, they want to see that you've been responsible with bill payments in the past if they're starting that new business relationship. Same go for utilities or insurance companies. They might just do a soft pull of your credit. Soft means they're not looking at everything on the credit report. They might not get the actual credit score. They just want to see that you've Again, paid your bills on time and been responsible before they start something up that's new. 
And one of the things that's really been coming up with us in the last few weeks are uh, members looking for the opportunity to refinance the debt or pay down debt that they have at a lower rate. Right now, mortgage rates, some of you might have heard, are surprisingly low, lower than they have been in the last few years. So there are a lot of people looking to refinance an existing mortgage to save money or people who just maybe want to consolidate some credit card debt or personal loans they have at a better rate than they had before. So there are two schools of thought when it comes to paying down debt, how to do it most efficiently. And it really comes down to what works best for you. You could pay down your lowest balance accounts first. So let's say you have a credit card with $100 on it, a credit card with $1,000 on it, and $20,000 on a car loan. Well, the easiest thing to do there would be knock out that $100 credit card and go at the next lowest balance and the next lowest balance. Uh, it makes you feel like you're accomplishing more in a quicker way, but it also will take away one more monthly payment that you have to make every month. So it frees up a whole monthly payment once one debt is knocked out before you go on to the next one. If you were to start with the highest interest account, interest rate accounts first, that will save you money in the end on the interest, right? Nobody wants to have that 30% credit card out there when they know they've got another one that is only 8% that has a much lower rate and will save you money in the long run. So not being out with highest balances will save you money in that way. And then once you do have debts paid off, if you eliminate a whole credit card payment, start putting that money into a savings account, start saving for a rainy day. That way, the next time something comes up, it doesn't end up on a credit card or you don't have to take out a loan to do that project you need to do. You'll already have that built into your savings plan. So that was it for me on credit. And again, my contact information is here. If there's anything you'd rather ask uh, personally, one-on-one, -on -one, don't hesitate to reach out. Thank you, Emily. We'll pause here for any questions for Emily. Again, please feel free to put them in the chat or unmute yourself if you want. I had a couple of questions submitted via the survey ahead of time. One person had asked um, how having different credit cards may affect your score. You kind of talked to, to some of that in terms of, you know, having one card versus having multiple cards. Um, how are your credit scores related to opportunities to buy a house? Can you speak to that at all, Emily? Yeah, I, you definitely need to have credit if you're going to be borrowing a mortgage loan to get that house. Uh, oftentimes, lenders want to see you have a minimum score uh, somewhere around 650 is pretty typical or 640. So you need to have at least that minimum. And usually mortgage lenders want to see that you have at least three active lines of credit on your credit history. So not just that one credit card in this situation, maybe you have two credit cards. Uh, sometimes if you have the electric bill in your name, that will even show up on the credit report as an open line, so that can help. But you have to have those three open lines and that minimum score of 640 to get a mortgage in many situations. Mm -hmm. um, another question was uh, just in general, what do you recommend as the best ways to improve your credit score if somebody's trying to improve? Ah, well, so if you're trying to improve because something happened to bring it down in the past, uh, my recommendation would be to work on paying down any existing past due items, if anything were in collections, to pay those down first. And if you need to get your foot back in the door with credit, an easy place to start would be a secured credit card if you don't qualify for a regular one yet. A secured card is a fantastic option. It's essentially, it works just like a regular credit card. You know, you get a piece of plastic, it has a limit on it. Let's say you have a $1,000 limit. You use it every month and you pay it off. But it's secured because you put down collateral to get that card. So you essentially put $1,000 into a savings account with your credit union, your bank. 
and they hold that as collateral in extension to give you that secured card. And that's a great place to start rebuilding if you need to. Oh, then that's interesting. Okay. And just as clarification, I know you will also will, um, you, Emily, will individually meet with people and review their credit score if they are interested in that, correct? Absolutely. We do that one on one for free through the credit union. Um, I imagine now with our, our lobbies being closed, those are things we could even do over the phone if that works for people. And uh, we'll go through it line by line and show you the credit report itself, go through it line by line just to help you interpret it. And if we see opportunities where we could save you money or make things more efficient, we'll certainly let you know. But do people have to be a UW Credit Union customer to use that? Or it can be anybody? Not at all. Yeah, okay. you could be a non-member and come in for that as well. Good. Um, I got another question in chat here. Um, will banks or credit unions do manual underwriting for somebody like a recent college grad who have who has no debt but presumably no not much of a credit history so i've heard this question before in regards to mortgages and i myself am not a mortgage loan officer so i'll, I'll honestly say i'm not the best person to ask about that uh, it's not something i hear about very frequently so it it would be best to do what you can to start building credit as well okay Okay. Very good. Any other last questions for Emily? That's all I had written in my in my question submitted earlier. So I'll pause a moment and see if there's any more questions that come in. Hey Emily, it's Katie Patterson. Hi. Hey. Um, so we have obviously the, the CARES Act and COVID, and we have some relief for federal student loans. How about the credit union? For those who maybe have some student loans or are repaying on their student loans, is there any relief for them at the private institution level, maybe even more specifically credit unions? So I myself am not entirely sure of everything that's included in the act that might affect us. It may just be down to an institution by institution level. So for instance, at UW Credit Union right now, we're offering a three month extension on any type of loan that you might have with us. So student loans, credit cards, personal loans, mortgages. We do actually have an online uh, form you can fill out that's right on our homepage if you go to uwcu.org to fill it out so we can get that extension for you right now. Good to know. All right, I think I'll go ahead and go on to our next presenter right now. Our second presenter is Mark Gamak, who is a lecturer in the finance department here on campus, and he's going to talk to us about savings and investing. Uh, thanks, Naomi. And I can just tell you, uh, for those of you that may be wondering, Emily is a terrific resource. She comes in and talks to a lot of our classes. <laughs> yeah. and. I've had students go and visit with her and also Katie, and they're just fabulous resources. So by all means, if you have a question, it would be well worth your time. Um, I'm a former alum. I was in the financial services industry for 35 years and wanted to come back and teach in my retirement and I've uh, been doing that. I've been teaching financial planning in the industry and at Whitewater, and I also teach personal financial planning 101 which has been really just a thrill. And Naomi and Katie both helped me with that class. And it's open to all students, all majors, and uh, you know, that are just interested in financial literacy. So it's been an honor to have that, those opportunities and looking forward to spending some time with you here today. If we could move on, Naomi, you know, when you talk about investing and savings, the, there's really, several things. If you're a financial planner, uh, you can do a tremendous service just helping clients think through their goals, whether they're short-term goals, mid-range goals, long-term goals. And if you're an individual and if you don't have a relationship with a planner, you're just thinking through what's the purpose for the money that I have here in front of me? Is it short-term money, mid-term money, or long-term money? So what do I mean by that? 
What I mean by that uh, will help you dictate where you put that money, where you save or invest that money for the future. It's really important to have a handle on that. So short-term money is money that you need within a year, you know, maybe a couple of years, but it's something that is coming due, that you're going to need it. You have a specific goal. And I'm talking about having an emergency fund in place already, you know, three to six months income in a savings account. And this might be short money that is needed above and beyond that uh, for a specific goal. It's really important when you have money that short-term needs, like when I talk to students that have tuition that's coming up and they're interested in the stock market, I have them think long and hard about making sure they have that money when they need it because the market can turn, right? It can go up, it can go down. And if you need the money in the short run, that money should really be in a money market account, savings account, short-term CD, so you know you're gonna have it. So kind of the price for liquidity uh, when you need it is the fact that you may earn a lower interest rate, but you have it when you need it. Midterm goals. Midterm goals could be saving for a child's college education, buying a home, three to 18 years. You can get more involved there in equities and bonds, some type of mixture of those two, as well as some liquid savings. And uh, those would be some goals that you want to make sure you have some equities involved with. And then long term. Long term is 20 plus years. You're looking for retirement. It's essential to have stocks, even though you've seen what's gone in the market the last couple of weeks. We're going to talk about why it's essential to have equities in your mix for the future. Now, granted, everybody has a risk tolerance that's uh, tolerable for them, but it's important that that equities are in the mix. As you take a look at this, it may be hard for some of you to see, but I'll just kind of describe it to you. We're taking a look at markets uh, from 1925 through about 2016. And we kind of go through this concept. If you invested a dollar in 1925, and I show my students this, and how did that dollar grow over approximately 90 years? And if you see a dollar there invested and you look at the blue line, the blue line is the lowest line, a dollar uh, just growing at the inflation rate uh, over the years, 90 years later, would have been worth $13.10. In other words, a, uh, a dollar at, at that point, uh, if you discount it, about $13.10, that's just growing with inflation. If I'm a little bit more conservative and I want to put it in T-bills, like a money market, a dollar invested in 1925 is worth about $20.58. So the point here is you get some growth over inflation, but you're really not picking up growth that you need to retire off of in terms of historical standards. If you say, all right, I'm going to step it up to long-term government bonds, a dollar invested in 1925 is worth $135 90 years later. On the other hand, if you get equities, we all know that equities are literally ownership positions in companies. You literally share in the upside and the downside with those companies, and that's where volatility comes into play, prices going up and down. But if you look at large company stocks, a dollar invested in 1925, 90, uh, 90 years later, each one of those dollars is worth $5,300. And if we look at small-term stocks, uh, you have more volatility, more risk, but they're worth $27,000. The point is, for you to really truly have growth on your money, you have to have equities as part of the mix in order to think about retirement. And you can see the volatility over the years, the Great Depression around 1930 in that chart, and the volatilities, recession, terrorist attacks, other things. But you can also see the trend line is up. So as long as you have long-term money, you can deal with volatility. And if you know the purpose is long-term and you know markets go up and down, the trend line will work in your favor. Let's go to the next one. Naomi, what's the cost of waiting? That's the other thing I really cover with my students. When they're getting started out of college, I encourage them to get started in that 401k. Take advantage if there's a match right away. That's an instant return on their money. The cost of waiting is just postponing it. And I encourage them to start right away at 22, even with some student loans and other things that are there. But if they put 10% of their income away, assuming $50,000 income, and you grow that to age 65 at about 8%, which is historical equity returns, you could even 
put it lower, a little higher, depending on which mix you have, you're going to have about a million three with that type, with this, this uh, over time. At 35, so you wait 10 years. You say, you know what, I want to wait until I'm established. I want to wait until I have a car and, and maybe pay off some of my student loans and other things. But if you wait, you save $50,000 over that 10 years, maybe you spent it on other things. But look at what you have at age 65. You've lost the compounding of those early years. You have half the amount you would have had had you started at 25. And you can go on. We can just show 45 here, 55, and 65, Naomi. And you just see that if your money doesn't have enough time to work for you, the magic of compounding interest is significant. So what do we learn from this? We learned from this, this is on the assumption about $100 a week with no employer match. And if we go back, Naomi, I'm sorry, sure, that's this good. concept of paying yourself first, a uh, really important concept. So with pay yourself first, what we're really trying to say is if you wait, as I tell my students, to save whatever's left over at the end of the month, you never make progress. If you have money literally deducted from a paycheck and you live off the difference, that's the beauty of a 401k or some of the plans that are available in the marketplace. You're paying yourself first. You can even do that for automatic savings plans and other things. The other thing is the dollar cost averaging. As we all know, the market was going up and up and up until recently. And when you just have something on automatic pilot and it takes it out every month, you're really not thinking about you know, that piece. It's just there. You're in, in, it's hard to predict what's the right time to invest. Nobody can really time the market. And so it just takes that guesswork out of it. And right now with the market down, you continue to dollar cost average and you're buying lower, but the key is it's long-term money. Regular contributions is the key, uh, no matter how small, and uh, that over time can make a huge difference. The other thing I wanna emphasize here uh, is having the proper risk tolerance. And there are different tools that are available. Uh, you know, there are, there are experts that are available for like the 403B plan through University of Wisconsin Whitewater uh, that can help you determine what's the right risk tolerance for you. So in a nutshell, yeah, you know, we have different resources here. There's obviously the Wisconsin Retirement System Plan. There's the 403B plan and some other resources. But uh, I'll, be, I'll open it up for questions and see what you have at this particular point. Thank you, Mark. The link we put on the slide there is a page from UWWHR with some more description of each of the um, kind of extra savings plans provided here. At yeah, Whitewater. and the only I have here too, uh, there's a benefits fair October, October 14th, the week of October 14th, uh, the Wisconsin you know, retirement through ETF uh, system benefits has a great webinar series. TIAA mm -hmm. uh, offers consultations. So there's a lot there. So and if you want your email, I think there's through? there's other ones too that are also doing other webinars and trainings right now. Yes, absolutely, website, so. absolutely. Questions for Mark? Thank you, Mark. You bet. Uh, when, when you, one question, um, do we really need to save additional money for retirement when we are in the state retirement? That would be the Wisconsin retirement system and social security, the kind of the, the automatic ones. What are your thoughts on that, Mark? I uh, the answer is, uh, like every great response is it depends. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, it depends on what your goals are. So it, I'm sure you can run projections through the Wisconsin Retirement System Plan. And if that, and you, there's also ways of running projections through Social Security in terms of what you've accrued over time. And if that's adequate for your goals, then you're set, you're ready to go. And uh, and if it's not adequate for your goals, uh, you know, the 403B plan through Whitewater is a way to put away additional money and have it grow tax deferred for you as well. So. Um, I know there's the ability too with the Wisconsin retirement system to put in lump sums or additional money above and beyond the baseline. And so those are things you can look at. Uh, those webinars that ETF runs, you know, are terrific resources. 
And uh, so it, it depends on your facts and circumstances and your goals. Certainly. Uh, a couple of questions I got from the survey ahead of time. One was, would you recommend sure. some books or resources, uh, kind of beginner books or resources on investment and financial advising? You know, I, I would recommend uh, just Googling, uh, not necessarily a book per se, but uh, you, could, you could just say, what are some of the beginning concepts related to investing? The mint.com is a resource. Emily might have another suggestion. Katie might have another uh, suggestion. So it just kind of depends on where you're at, but there are literally, literally thousands of financial concept type books and planning type books in the marketplace. And uh, so I tend to Google something that's uh, a good resource um, and uh, that's, that's in look into a particular area. Mm -hmm. oh, another one kind of related to retirement savings. How can I protect my retirement savings from being used to pay for a nursing home? Mm, um, you know, our next presenter may have some concepts on that, but I'm not aware of, I mean, there are things somebody can do over time, like gifting, but it, it, you know, but there's, there's things like, uh, if you go into a nursing home and claim uh, that you need to go on Medicaid, you know, they do a look back and they look at different features and uh, they look for all the games that come into play. So. One of the things you can do is buy long-term care insurance. And long-term care insurance, depending on your level of assets, is probably one of the better ways of protecting your estate because it's very sad. There's a lot of sad stories that come into play, but I'm sure our next presenter may have some concepts there. And uh, it's very possible that somebody's retirement savings may be used for that type of care, depending on where it is. But uh, Paul might be able to you know, suggest some things that from a legal perspective that are different. Uh, but long-term care insurance is certainly one thing that can help protect your estate and what you've built up. Sure. Well, that's a good segue then. If there's no further questions for Mark, we'll segue to Paul Nylon, the accountant and tax lawyer. Um, yeah, so my name is Paul Nylon. Um, I'm an attorney and CPA and assistant professor at, uh, in, the, in the College of Business. I teach mostly graduate uh, tax classes there. And then I also have my own um, estate planning firm with another guy, a uh, great looking guy here, Nathan Osborne. Um, we've got an office in Whitewater, an office in Milwaukee. And I was just talking to Mark before this and uh, unfortunately crisis times brings uh, people in sort of urgent need of updating estate plan documents or with lots of good questions. So we are, we're definitely, um, we're funneling a lot of those through our process right now. A lot of people have lots of really valid concerns. So uh, I probably should just start off by saying, if I don't get to any so anyone's questions today and you've got like a burning question for me. Um, uh, our firm doesn't like charge anything just to like answer questions or meet with people or have a phone call. Um, so you can always feel free to shoot me an email and I can get back to you with my thoughts. Um, that being said, what I'd like to do is, uh, I know the topic was wills and trusts, and I think uh, you know everyone's capable of you know googling what a will is and what a trust is, and unfortunately, um, uh, I would say my experience has lent itself to to suggest that most people, um, when they start googling things in estate planning, they find out about 50% of the right answers and 50% of the wrong answers. And so what I like to do is I like to put some questions up here. I'll have Naomi throw up here to just sort of uh, get people um, sort of testing your own knowledge about how wills and trusts work and what different processes are called. Um, so the first one I want to go uh, start out with is uh, what happens if you if you have just a will? And what I what I mean by is just a will uh, is you don't have a you don't have a trust in place, uh, not a fancy trust, but a revocable living trust. What's the name of the process that your kids go through, your heirs go through? Um, the answer to that question is probate. And so if you've had a parent who's died or maybe a brother or sister, 
you know that probate is one of the most costly and timely legal endeavors that you will go through. And so from a practical approach, I would say probably nine out of 10 people that I meet with um, scrap the idea of just having a will, you know, a do-it-yourself will, or even having us just do you will, and instead do something called a revocable living trust, which avoids probate. Without it, it's just a, a legal tool we use to help transfer the property from you to your kid. Um, this next question here about what probate costs, um, it's, it's rough. It's really rough. And I think when people hear these numbers, they're kind of taken aback. Um, the example I like to use is, uh, what's it cost to get divorced? Well, anyone who's got divorced and had to pay a lawyer bill to a divorce lawyer knows super expensive. If you have, if you die with, uh, only a will in place and no type of trust in place and your uh, estate goes through probate, uh, your kids can expect to pay in the state of Wisconsin between four and 6% of your probate estate. So if you die with up to say a million dollars of probate stuff, probate stuff is like your house, cars, land, um, financial accounts that don't have proper beneficiary designations. If you die with a million bucks worth of stuff and all you have is a will in place, you thought you were doing your due diligence, um, your kids will pay an estate lawyer or a probate lawyer between four and 6% of that state value. So that would be 40 to $60,000. Uh, that fact alone drives most people after they hear one estate plan presentation into saying, what can I do to make sure my kids don't pay that? And so that's why we often do these state plans for people. And as part of those, people put in revocable living trust to avoid probate. Um, the next question here, uh, sort of an ancillary question and people, um, kind of mix all these documents up together, but this is a scenario I like to give people. So let's say you have to go to the Mayo Clinic. Um, they have some tester procedures done and you're unconscious. Can the doctor tell your kids what your medical issue is? And the answer to that is no, it, unless you've already been to the Mayo Clinic for authorization up there. And so a big document people often miss in their estate plans that they couple along with uh, these other documents like revocable living trusts or HIPAA authorizations. And all these do is they basically say, hey, give my kids the ability to get an update from the doctor. Give my parents the right to get an update from the doctor. So HIPAA authorizations, crucial forms. If you have adult children that are over the age of 18 and they get shipped off to a hospital that uh, this happens, unfortunately, at Whitewater more often than we'd like to think. If they have to go to a, a doctor's office that's not local in town, that they don't have their local doctor sitting right there, um, you as a parent better have a HIPAA authorization for your kids so that so that doctor can tell you what's going on with your adult kids. Um, next question here, what's the difference between a living will and a medical power of attorney? So a living will is basically a document uh, that uh, estate planners use to say like, if you know I'm on a ventilator and I'm more or less brain dead, I, I can, I really have uh, almost no chance of being resuscitated. Uh, what do you want to do with me? Do you want that? Do you want to pull the plug? For some of the people that are probably in their 30s, 40s, 50s and older, you probably remember the Terry Schiavo case that captured the news a couple decades ago. Um, had that case had a living will, that she had a living will in place, um, that whole fiasco would have been avoided. So living will um, is different than a medical power of attorney. Medical power of attorney is a broad document that really allows people to uh, uh, make medical decisions for someone else for all sorts of circumstances. You could be going in for an ACL surgery and just, you know, under anesthesia and that medical power of attorney would allow someone to make a medical decision. For you. So again, another key document that we like to put in place for people. A couple along with, uh, you know, usually a, a revocable living trust every now and then it's just a will. Um, financial power of attorney, do you have a financial power of attorney in place? So this is the legal ability for someone to sign your name. Um, vital document. Uh, what happens if you are unable for whatever reason, you're in the hospital or you're just, you're unable to file your own income tax return? Well, the IRS, I'm sorry, has no sympathy for you. 
And so you need to have a financial power of attorney in place in order for someone else to sign your name and file that tax return. And so again, another crucial document to have in place. Um, the next slide here, uh, I mentioned this, why do most people do revocable living trust after state planning? Number one reason is to avo avoid probate. They don't want their kids stuck with that huge probate. Um, I like to put this question out to people because this is the number one question I always get people, I always ask people when they come to me with their will and they say, I'm convinced all I want is a will. I, but the follow-up question I usually, I usually pose to them is, how is the house, how is the legal title on your house going to be passed to your kids? And their response will be, well, I've got in my will, the house goes to so-and-so. That will does not pass legal title. That will has to be overseen by a judge. And so that is a very sloppy way to pass on a house. That house will go through probate. You got a $400,000 house and the probate lawyer charges 6%, it's gonna cost them $24,000 to transfer your house to your kids. It's a ridiculous plan. Um, when you and your spouse die, uh, what are the tax rules that apply to your kids that receive your IRA? For those of you that are up to speed on the SECURE Act, um, you might be familiar that these rules change significantly. So what we mean when I talk about your kids taking your IRA or 401k, in the tax law, that's called an inherited IRA, not a spousal IRA. And the rules for those changed drastically. I've got a flow chart on the next couple slides that show people kind of how complicated these rules are. But the, the point is um, that question alone is probably a reason to talk to an estate planning lawyer. So at least you know how your main assets will be taxed when your kids receive them. Um, what happens here if you leave your, uh, uh, you know, lots of financial advisors like to say, hey, just list your kids as beneficiaries on your financial accounts. And our, our response to that is usually, you know, okay, that's, that's the sort of easiest, least thoughtful way to do it. But if you're just looking to do something in two seconds and be done with it, sure. The question I like to pose people is, well, what happens if something bad is going on with your kids at the time they inherit one of your financial accounts? So let's say they're going through lawsuits, they're going through bankruptcy, they're going through divorce. Well, there's a there's a Supreme Court case on this called USV Ramaker that states when one of these retirement accounts becomes inherited, it no longer has the protection as though it were your own. So right now, if you were to get sued, if you were to rear, if you were texting and driving and rear-ended someone, Gruber Law Office or wh whatever law office you see on TV would not go after your IRA. That is a protected asset. If your kids had inherited an IRA, however, and your kids were texting and driving, that attorney would try to go after that IRA. So there's 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 legal tools here available. You can do IRA trusts and other things to protect those in place before something like that happens. And then the last question I've got here, I always like to just ask people about this when they're thinking about their estate plan as, um, you know, we always want to just think about these things visually. What does your estate plan look like right now? Is it, you know, a stack of sort of messy um, papers that are stapled, they're paper clipped together, and you're not even sure what's in there? Or do you sort of have a well-organized binder with tabs for all these documents they talked about? Because the reality is when you need these documents, when your kids need these documents, that is not the time for them to be sorting through an, un an unorganized mess. That's the time where Nice binder with all this stuff organized and signed and notarized, so you're ready to go. Um, so I know that's I covered a lot. Naomi's got a slide here, I think, on the next one. I'd like to just show this to people because I always ask people, you know, do you know what happens to your IRA when it gets inherited by your kids from a tax perspective? Um, and the answer is it's complicated. So these are some different routes you can take. But uh, what I like to tell people is that if you don't proactively do your own estate plan, you are going to be by default opting into the state and the federal uh, estate plans, which is not great, right? The state of Wisconsin, the federal government, the IRS, you know, their job is to raise revenue. Um, their job is not necessarily to pass legal title on to exactly who you want. So I, I like to hand this flow chart out in meetings to people and say, hey, let's walk through your scenario. Let's talk through uh, how your IRA is going to be taxed to your kids. Shouldn't you care about that? It's probably your largest asset you're going to pass on. So 
with that, I'll, uh, I'll pause right there. I know I covered a lot of information. Um, you can always go to our website and uh, click the contact tab and uh, fire me a quick uh, or fire us a message and we can get back to you. You can always uh, send me an email to my Whitewater email account as well. Uh, I'm happy to answer some questions at this point. Very good. We got uh, one question I see. There. What about beneficiary designations in your IRAs or other investment accounts? Do those have to go through probate? Uh, no. So if you have a valid beneficiary designation on an IRA, that account is not is not considered a probate asset. So the um, uh, the, the for for the probate question is off the table. The question after that is what's the tax consequence for that uh, person who's listed there. But you're absolutely right. If you have a beneficiary designation, those avoid probate. You, um, if you don't have a beneficiary designation, you don't have anybody listed, then it would go through probate. Okay. Um, another question I got was um, in the survey before as well, was what's the average cost to prepare all these recommended documents you're talking about and what information do people need to gather and, and bring to you in order to start that process? So um, I, do, I don't wanna give people like a like an exact number on what it costs. I would sure. say to do, I'll just say generically speaking, um, I think if you just go out into the marketplace to, to do basically everything we talked about doing that usually costs you somewhere between 2500 bucks and six grand something like that so um i think at the end of the day i don't think this is a stretch for people at the end of the day you, at least what i see is you often get what you pay for you can always sort of try to google around and try to figure out um who can maybe do like a cookie cutter job for you um the other thing i'll point out real quick you got to be wary of is there are some law firms that do things hourly so they say we're just going to bill by the hour and what it costs is what it costs then there's other law firms that just give you like a flat fee they say, hey we'll do all the work you can call us whenever you want for this flat fee i know at my firm um, we've moved to a completely flat fee model because it just makes the client relationship so much better people call us with questions and we can answer it and uh, they don't have to worry about getting an invoice from us so we've we've gone down that path. Okay. Another one talking about kind of I got this question ahead of time. Um, a couple of people asked about is it possible for me to do a will on myself using an online source? And a related question somebody asked is a handwritten will a legal a legal document and free from being yep, challenged so, in courts. Um, yeah. So. I think this is, um, you know, I always, I always uh, smile at the do it sort of the DIY do it yourself well because um, let me give you let me give you a story here. This is <laughs> this is I think probably a good anecdote. So Supreme Court Justice um, uh, Stevens died a number of years ago. He so he's Supreme Court so he's a very smart guy, right? Um, when he put together his own estate plan, now he was not an estate plan lawyer. He had like a long background in other areas of the law, but he wasn't a estate plan lawyer. His own estate plan ended up going through probate because he didn't dot all his I's and cross all his T's. Um, so I sort of put that out to people to say, there are Supreme Court justices that mess up their own estate plans. Um, uh, Buyer beware, I guess. I mean, to do it yourself with a will. I mean, the downside, like as I mentioned, with the will is it's still going through probate. So, um, to be honest with you, the only people my firm does just wills for, or even recommends just wills for, is like last week, uh, probably no, two weeks ago, we had a lady who was 94 years old, had uh, lived in an apartment, had uh less than 20 grand in a checking account and had like a car that was probably worth 500 bucks if that's the type of scenario you're in where apartment you know your kids are like in their 60s 
you really are passing nothing on, yeah, a will is perfect because there's nothing, uh, there's a rule that basically says if you have less than 50 grand in assets in Wisconsin, you don't have to go through probate. But if you have more than 50 grand and all you have is a will, your state goes through probate. So I, I think a lot of people, to be honest with you, Naomi, a lot of people do uh, wills uh, like kind of right when they get out of college or right when they get married. And I think they do that just because they don't want to have nothing. Mm-hmm. And so mm-hmm. that's the sort of the, and, and I realize going to lawyers feels expensive, so they don't want to spend the money. And I get that. Um, so, you know, it's better than do it. It's better than having nothing, but certainly as you start accumulating more assets and as your family gets bigger, um, doing it yourself just seems like a Herculean task. That's, that's my own two cents. How often do you recommend uh, yeah. people need to like go back and review their will and documents? Is there certain timelines or like when you yeah, so have kids? Great or... question. So great question. So we, we generally recommend um, if you come to us, and let's say you have kids that are uh, two and six, um, we generally tell people, uh, assuming you don't have like a, oh, we have to assume some other things here. Let's just say, let's say you've you got two kids, you're married, so two and six, and let's say you've got three or four hundred thousand dollars worth of just stuff, house, retirement accounts. Um, you don't need to update that estate plan until those kids become adults. Once they become adults, then that estate plan needs to be updated because they're no longer minors. You may want one of those kids to be a trustee for you at some point. So I would say it's not based on uh, years, it's based on life events. And so as your kids cross into uh, from minority to majority, that's a life event. And then the other uh, time I would uh, put this, the other life event I put into place is, um, have you you know slowly been accumulating more assets? Because the, the more assets you have, the more the larger the tax consequences become. If you come to me with a hundred grand worth of stuff, the tax impact of your stuff just isn't that big. You come with eight hundred thousand dollars well then your tax decisions become just vital because you know one percent of a bigger number is just a bigger number Mm -hmm. um and then the other thing i would say is you would update it uh for law changes like very specific law changes unfortunately the secure act which i think was mentioned earlier Mm -hmm. um the secure act was a uh historically large estate planning change and so we have been reviewing tons of estate plans recently for this recent change. People already had plans in place. So we've been reviewing them. A lot of the language in these documents is suboptimal now that the SECURE Act is in place. Um, but we also have a lot of people that say, hey, I know the SECURE Act is in place. I don't know what's in it. And I'm using that as an excuse just to do my estate plan for the first time. So um, as you get more money, as your kids get older, or, and as there's a large changes, uh, legal changes that come in place, those are sort of the three things I'd, I'd put on the uh, list. Okay. Very good. Other questions? Uh, I'm seeing in the chat, Julie, all right. Um, any chance the SECURE Act could be revoked? All right. Um, I will, I will put an informal bet with everyone here. Uh-huh. Uh, the SECURE Act uh, had, lots of rep, so had lots of revenue raising provisions. So the government raising revenue. Bonus money to anyone who can name the last time the government put in a, a law that raised money, raised money, and then revoked it. I... I'm struggling to think of a good one right now. So I think the answer to that, my, if I had to put my betting hat on, I would say probably not because um, for them to revoke it would mean they'd be giving up the revenue. Now, you know, there are things like tax cuts and things like that that happen, but um, the big tax uh, raisers there uh, have to do with the inherited IRAs. And given how the bipartisan support, the large bipartisan support that was in place, to change the tax rules on inherited IRAs, we don't forecast that being revoked. Not anytime soon, you know. Coronavirus aside, we don't forecast any of that stuff being revoked. Mm-hmm. 
Very good. Any last minute questions for Paul or any of our presenters? I'm going to put our follow up survey in the chat here. That should be a live link. Well, one more thing, Naomi. Can I uh, can I chime in once more? Sure. Uh, Mark had uh, someone asked Mark about um, long term care costs. Oh yeah. So uh, I don't want to give like a super long answer on this, but the answer to this is uh, the short answer is yes. There are things you can do from a legal perspective. Um, there. You know, we have to sit down and have a conversation about it because the rules can get kind of tricky. Uh, as Mark talked about, there's a five year look back period and things of that nature. But um, there are other types of uh, trusts you could put in place and um, uh, gifting mechanisms and things of that that people use all the time that are very common to sort of uh, hedge against the fact that they don't want medical costs to you know, put a lien on their house or um, start wiping away some of the money they're going to leave for the kids. So there are there are tools available in that tool belt. Cool. Very good. Very good. Well, thank you. I want to just express my thanks again to all of our presenters for sharing their insights and to all of our participants and attendees. Thank you for taking time out of your day to attend today. As I said, again, please click on that link in the chat window and give us your anonymous feedback to Katie and I. That will help her and I for planning future events. And that's where you can also request individual follow-up from any of our presenters, if you would like. So that is all I have for you today, unless anybody else wants to stick around and ask some more questions. <laughs>